welcome back. Today we are looking at Shakespeare's Henry IV Part II, the second half of the story of Prince Hal and Falstaff. And man is this play packed with good stuff. Part one had this rich conflict between Prince Hal and Harry Percy Hotspur. We saw how Prince Hal was walking this line in youthful rebellion with his friendship with Falstaff, and then in loyalty and duty towards his father, Henry IV. And all of this in the backdrop of Henry IV's questionable legitimacy as king. After all, he took the throne away from Richard II. There's so many fantastic scenes and moments in Henry IV Part I, and Part II continues exactly where the last one left off. We still have Prince Hal, who is a young man who has lived, at least on the surface, a bit of a rebellious childhood. And yet he's nearing the age where he's going to have to step into his father's shoes and become king. But we saw also in the last play that he wasn't completely rebellious and that he was not cold-hearted towards his father. There's that wonderful moment where he saves his father's life in the midst of battle. And then he does the heroic deed of killing Harry Percy, which shows not only his love for his father, but his also future potential for nobility and greatness and heroism. And his relationship with Falstaff is a sort of child father. Falstaff is childish in every way, in spite of being an old fat man. And Hal's relationship with Falstaff is this sort of relationship with the idea of eternally being a child, staying in carefree youth forever. He has to let go of Falstaff before he can step into the role as a true leader and king. And Henry IV Part II continues that exploration, and does so in a way that's honestly, kind of painful. Shakespeare doesn't make it easy for us. Shakespeare helps us to understand what the world would be like if Hal stayed forever in this carefree and irresponsible childhood in his relationship with Falstaff. And we see that that would definitely destroy Hal's ability to become the leader that he becomes. And it would also damage and destroy the country. But just because we know that doesn't make it easier to let go of Falstaff. Falstaff has a real charm about him. He is a, a very fun, hilarious character, one of the favorites in all of Shakespeare's plays. But this play also doesn't shy away from showing us the victims of living like Falstaff. Falstaff defrauds and cheats several people. We see the young good-hearted men that Falstaff is throwing to the wolves in war, just to line his pockets. Falstaff, no matter how much we may love him, is not the right choice for Hal. So the ending is going to be difficult when Hal finally severs ties with Falstaff. This play is going to help us reach this point by showing how struggling with letting go of the pleasures of youth, while also desiring to please and honor his father. There are also far fewer interactions between Hal and Falstaff in this play. Only two real scenes where the two of them are together. Instead, Hal is going to have to shift to his true father and take the hard-won wisdom that his father has to offer as he steps into his position as king. It's important to remember that Prince Hal is going to become Henry V, who was in Shakespeare's day famous as a national hero. And the only way to do that is, as we saw foreshadowed in the previous play, to let go of the one father figure of Falstaff and take his true father, Henry IV, even if that's hard for Hal, and for the audience, who went so far as to demand another play with Falstaff in it. All right, let's look at the action of this play. The play opens up with a prologue by the figure of Rumor. And Rumor runs ahead of the battle we saw at the end of the last play, spreading all kinds of different stories about what happened. Was Hotspur victorious, or was he destroyed in the last battle? This sets up the idea as Northumberland is waiting for news from his son, Harry Percy Hotspur. And he hears several conflicting reports before he ultimately discovers that his son has been killed in battle and all of his plans have been destroyed. Now, if we remember, Percy had set out to battle and he had several people who were supposed to back him, but they all stepped down at the last moment, including his father. His father was claiming to be sick and therefore was unable to join the battle. But in this moment, he realizes that now that his son has been killed, he's going to have to step up and fight this fight. We cut back to Falstaff, who is basking in the fact that he has received all the glory for killing Hotspur. 
even though it was actually Prince Hal who did it. And he's waltzing around with his newfound reputation, and he bumps into the Chief Justice. Now, he's earned this reputation as this great warrior, and so he's supposed to jump back into the fighting because a new rebellion is stirring up. And so the Chief Justice shows him some respect in his new reputation, even though the Chief Justice would like very much to arrest him for the robbery at Gad's Hill in the last book. And Falstaff plays like he's deaf and doesn't want to hear what the Justice says, and there's a lot of comic relief back and forth. And we can see that Falstaff has come up in the world a little bit in that the Chief Justice respects his reputation, even if he thinks of him still as a scoundrel. Meanwhile, in scene three, we cut to the conspirators who are still trying to fight against Henry IV. The Archbishop of York, Mulberry, Hastings, Lord Baldolf, not to be confused with Falstaff's Bardolf, are all waiting to see if they will get word from Northumberland, Hotspur's father. They feel pretty good about their chances now that they're all united against Henry IV, especially since he's going to have to split his army, one part against France, one part against Glendower, and one part against them. And so ends Act One, with rebellion on the wing, Falstaff on the rise, and King Henry hard-pressed. Act two returns to Falstaff, who is being challenged by Mistress Quickly. She's the hostess of the inn that he's always at, though she, we saw her many times in the past play. And she's challenging him because he hath eaten her out of house and home. He owes her loads of money. And he's also promised many times to marry her. And so she's caught up a couple of ruffians to try to catch him and demand money back from him. And there's a big scuffle in the street, and the Chief Justice comes and intervenes. He's irritated to see Falstaff in the middle of a scuffle again, and especially because Falstaff is supposed to be already going around the countryside conscripting men for service in the army against the rebellion. But he's slacking, as usual. When the Chief Justice intervenes, Falstaff whispers kind words to the hostess and gets her back on his side. And the Chief Justice urges Falstaff to get back to work. Falstaff instead plans to go to a party at the inn. In scene two of act two, we finally get to see Prince Hal, who's hanging out with Poins again. Now, if you remember, Poins is the son of a lord, but he's not that important. He is a second son. He's also a rascal who's a lot of fun to hang out with, but not worthy of Prince Hal's company. And this is a great scene because it sets up Prince Hal thinking about his father's coming death. Now, it's already been established in the play that his father is sick. All of these griefs and all of these cares have made him ill. And although he overcame the last rebellion, he has grown weak and weary, and is probably not going to live very long. Now, most people assume Prince Hal, being a rebellious young man, is probably glad at the news, because that means he's going to be king sooner. But we see here that Prince Hal is not at all happy about that. Although he's put on this face of the rebellious young man, he actually grieves over his father's coming death. And yet, as he becomes caught up more and more in the court, he finds he misses the small pleasures of his rebellious youth. Things such as small beer. And as the prince chats with Poins, we discover that although he would like to weep for his father's death, he also can't because of the position he's put himself in. Everyone would think him a hypocrite if he began to cry over his father's death. And so, although he does truly grieve, he also has to keep it inside. At this point, Bardolph shows up with a letter from Falstaff to Hal, and he reads it together with Poins. It's actually a letter condemning Poins and saying how Poins is actually trying to get Hal to marry his sister. Which Poins denies, but there is a sense of guilt there that Poins is trying to use Hal in an ascent to greatness. And they make fun of Falstaff's letter, but there's also that tension between Hal and Poins in this moment. And Hal lets it go, but it's clear that all of his old friends, all of the ruffians that he's been hanging out with, are hoping that at his father's death, they will all rise to power. Hal and Poins find out that Falstaff is dining in East Cheap tonight, and so they decide to play a joke in which they both dress as drawers or servers and serve him at his table without revealing their presence, and so they get to overhear and see what he does. At this point, we cut back to Northumberland, who was preparing to go join the rebellion, 
But when Lady Percy comes out, the widow of Hotspur, she reminds him that he abandoned Hotspur when Hotspur was in need. And so why should he set his honor on this moment? Why not run off to Scotland? Her speech is very painful and emotional, and it's a fitting conclusion to the Lady Percy we saw in the previous play. Rather heartbreaking after their relationship that we looked at in the last play. If you want to look closer at this speech, I highly recommend the video by Shakespeare with Sarah. She does a fantastic job unpacking this speech. I'll put the link down below or in the card above. But Lady Percy is convincing and Northumberland decides to flee to Scotland rather than join the rebels. We cut back to Eastcheap where we find Poins and Prince Hal have dressed themselves as drawers, along with Francis from the last play. And in comes Falstaff who meets with Hostess quickly and Dol Tearsheet, who is something of a prostitute. And Dahl and Falstaff bicker for a while until Ancient Pistol comes in, who is Falstaff's ensign. And Pistol is a firebrand who's constantly quoting snatches of poetry and song and going off the handle and fighting. And in this scene, he starts insulting Dahl and then Falstaff whips out his sword and the two of them fight for a moment. He drives Pistol out of the room. Whereat Dahl melts all over Falstaff and flatters him up and down for his heroism rescuing her there. And then she starts asking about Poins and the Prince, and Falstaff starts talking trash about the two of them, which, of course, Poins and Hal overhear. They finally pop out and mock him for his words against them, and he tries to cover for himself and flatter them by saying that he didn't want to talk big about them in front of the wicked doll and Mistress Quickly. And so he winds up getting himself comically in trouble with everybody by trying to explain his way out of this, as he usually does. But just in the middle of this fun, Peto runs in to tell the prince that his father needs him immediately. The rebellion is on the rise, his father is sick, and the prince is needed back at court. And Prince Hal, in this moment, rebukes himself for allowing himself to run away with all of these jokes when he has serious business at hand. Now, this is the only moment where he has any fun with Falstaff in this play. And it ends with him being angry with himself for doing so. It's like one last hurrah of jokes with Falstaff, and yet he regrets it instantly. By heaven's points, I feel me much to blame, so idly to profane the precious time, when tempest of commotion, like the south born with black vapor, doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak, Falstaff, good night. And he runs out. Falstaff himself must also go, and he goes with much regret away from Dahl and Mistress Quickly, before pausing to call Dahl back to him. The end of Act Two. Act 3 is the first time we see Henry IV in this play. He is sickly and he is sitting up worrying about all of his troubles. He thinks about how kings never really get to sleep. They all carry the weight and trouble of the world. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. He calls Warwick in to talk with him and they talk about their chances against all of the rebels. And he also reflects back how very recent it was that Richard II was king and how recent it was that all of these rebels were his friends and supporters and who backed him against Richard, and now they've turned on him. But he does have the good news that Glendower is dead, which means that he only has two fronts to fight on. In scene two, we meet Justice Shallow and Justice Silence, two corrupt old country justices, or old men who like to brag about their past. They knew Falstaff when he was a young man. And Falstaff is coming to them in order to conscript young men for service. There's a lot of puns off of names here, including characters like Shallow and Silence, of course, but also characters like Moldy and Bullcalf and Shadow. There are several young men who are being conscripted for war, and Falstaff is supposed to select among them which ones are prepared to go to war. There's one whose name is Wart, who is a pathetic little man, as well as Shadow and Feeble. None of these soldiers look like they will amount to anything. Whereas Moly is a young man who's been avoiding action for a long time, but definitely should be in action. And Bullcalf is plenty strong enough, he just doesn't want to go to war. By the end of this sequence, Falstaff and Bardolph allow Moly and Bullcalf to get away with bribing them to get out of fighting. Whereas Wart, Shadow, and Feeble choose to go and fight. And we see this rather touching moment where Feeble and Wart are talking about how they can only give their lives for their king and their country. No man's too good to serve's prince, and let it go which way it will. He dies this year, is quit for the next. 
And so these good-hearted young men who are completely incapable of fighting because they're so pathetic and weak are going to be thrown to the wolves out there, whereas those men who have the capability to be soldiers are getting away with bribery. This brings into mind what happened at the end of the last play, where Falstaff did something similar. Now, we didn't actually see him do it, but we heard him talk about it. He led a bunch of riffraff into battle in order to line his pockets with bribes, and they all became cannon fodder. Now we see the hearts of the men he's throwing to the wolves, and it's pretty saddening. The scene ends as Falstaff takes his new soldiers and heads off to war, but he has a little soliloquy in which he plans to come back and manipulate Shallow and feed off of his bounty. Shallow is a lewd and gross old man with a very exaggerated memory of his past achievements, and Falstaff means to make good use of him to line his own pockets. In Act 4, Scene 1, we see Prince John facing off against the rebels. The rebels have just found out that Northumberland is not going to join them, with, which shakes some of their hopes. And so when Prince John looks at their list of grievances and promises to answer those and redress their problems, most of the rebels quickly jump on his promises. And then both sides dismiss their armies. The rebel army is all too happy to run away. But the king's army doesn't actually leave, they stay in place. And so as soon as the rebel army is gone, Prince John arrests the leaders of the rebellion and then sends his army to hunt down all the stragglers. He says, yes, I will keep my promise. I will address your grievances, but you all are traitors and you're going to be executed. And so the rebellion is ended rather quickly. We cut to a scene where Falstaff bumps into a runaway knight named Colville. And Falstaff challenges him, and when Colville hears it's Falstaff, he recognizes Falstaff's reputation as the man who killed Hotspur, and so he surrenders to him. So Falstaff gets another feather in his cap. He turns over Colville to Prince John, who doesn't really believe in his greatness, and who chides him a bit for coming so late to the war. But Falstaff decides to return to London by way of Justice Silence, so he can milk Justice Silence from some of his cash. He also has a soliloquy about alcohol, in which he says that young men should drink sack, comparing and contrasting Prince John to Prince Hal. Now, it's a comical comparison contrast, but we do see Prince John as a very effective leader at this point, whereas Prince Hal has not really done anything great in this play. And that sets up attention as we get to the end of this play, especially as the other sons of the king have been serving their father and stopping a rebellion. Is Prince Hal ready to be king? In fact, the next scene, the king is speaking to his sons, and he's speaking about Prince Hal and trying to get them to have a good relationship with him. Make sure that you serve your brother well. Make sure you support your brother. And all of them are feeling rather awkward because they know that Prince Hal is off having fun right now rather than doing his duty. There's an uncomfortable moment where the other princes are in some ways attempting to cover for Hal. And when the king finds out that he's actually probably out in East Cheap having fun, the king is upset and overwhelmed. But at this point, he receives news. And the news is that the rebellion has been overthrown. And it is very good news. But in his weakened state, the news overexcites the king, who then collapses, and they carry him off to another chamber. At this point, the prince does come in, and he sees the state that his father is in, and he's very upset. And so he goes to sit by his father, who is unconscious. The rest of them leave him alone, and the prince, sitting beside his father, begins to speak to the crown. He sees the crown as this painful burden, just like King Henry IV saw it earlier in the play. And he feels that this crown has killed his father. When he doesn't see his father breathing, he assumes that his father has died. And then, in his grief, he picks up the crown and places it on his own head as the new burden that he must bear. And with it, he walks out of the room. The king awakens and, finding himself alone, calls for his sons. He also looks around and finds that the, the crown is gone. And when he realizes that the prince has taken the crown, he assumes this means that the prince is eager for him to die and ready to take the throne away from him. He is deeply, deeply grieved. When Warwick finds the prince in the next room, Warwick describes the prince as having his cheeks bathed with tears, but the king still doesn't understand why he took the, the crown. And so the king dismisses everyone to speak to the prince. And the king chides him and accuses him of being so eager to steal the crown away. 
and how he's going to, in his irresponsibility, destroy the kingdom. Let all the tears that should bedew my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up, vanity. Down, royal state. All you sage counselors hence. And to the English court a simple now, from every region, apes of idleness. Now, neighbor confines, purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sin in the newest kind of ways? Be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might, for the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows, when that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. So King Henry foresees a future in which Prince Hal lets the kingdom be overrun by lawlessness. And the innocent are abused, the kingdom is torn apart. But that is not the prince's plan. And the prince at this point kneels before him and places the crown back on the bed. And then he explains himself, saying, Coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost, my liege, to think you were. I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it. The care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other, less fine in carrot, is more precious, preserving life in medicine potable. But thou, most fine, most honored, most renowned, hast eat thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it, as with an enemy that hath before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. And so, he says, I struggled with the crown as the murderer of my father. I was not putting it on in anticipation, in desire. I was putting it on to wrestle with it. And Henry IV is so pleased with Hal's response that he says, O oh, my son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. The apology that Prince Hal has in some ways even strengthens their relationship further. And so at this point, the relationship between the king and his son is restored just at the end of King Henry IV's life. And sort of like that moment at the end of the last play where King Henry IV realized that his son does love him and is willing to protect him in battle, we see also that King Henry IV realizes that his son does love him and is willing to honor him at his death. And knowing that his son actually does care about him and about the kingdom, he then gives one last speech of fatherly advice. Unlike the vision of the broken kingdom, which would be the kind of kingdom if Prince Hal were to continue in the same vein, the irresponsible ruler, he offers him advice on how to be an effective ruler. After all the rebellion that King Henry IV had to deal with, he never was able to do what he wanted to do as king because of these constant rebellions that rose up. And all of them in response to the questionability of his own position as king. But now that he's passing the throne on to Henry V, Prince Hal has the chance to rule with more legitimacy. But he also advises his son, okay, you need to give the people something to do other than rebel against you. My original plan was to go to Jerusalem and fight in the holy wars. But you need to have a purpose that you can bend England towards so that it doesn't turn on you. Which, of course, is foreshadowing of the next play, Henry V. At this point, Prince John comes in after coming back from the war, and the king greets him, but the king is definitely dying at this moment. And so he turns and he asks, what room was it that he had collapsed in? When he finds out that the room was called the Jerusalem Room, he sees the sense of humor as well as the providence in it. He had heard a prophecy that he was to die in Jerusalem, and he always thought that meant that he was going to the Holy Land to repay his actions against Richard II. But here he finds he is dying in a different Jerusalem than he thought. And so though it's not at all what he expected, it feels like it was meant to be, and it feels purposeful, which in some ways gives us a sense of rightness to the moment when Prince Hal takes the throne and becomes Henry V. In Act 5, we cut over to Falstaff returning with Shallow. 
and we see the kind of abuses that Shallow commits as a corrupt justice, not being very much about fairness and rightness, but more about personal gain. This is the world that Hal is leaving behind. In scene two, we cut back to London, where Warwick is speaking to the Chief Justice, and the Chief Justice is feeling very uncomfortable, because the Chief Justice was always at odds with Prince Hal and his friends, Falstaff and the other riffraff, because the Justice was trying to uphold the law, and so he felt like he was fighting against that rebellious prince, and now that this prince has risen to power, he feels like he's going to bear the brunt of Prince Hal's ire. The rest of the princes gather around as well, and they're all uncertain what the new king is going to be like. Is he going to be a good ruler? Or is he going to elevate all of the worst sorts of people into positions of power? Are they all going to be bowing down to Falstaff? The prince comes in in a very princely kind of way. He reminds them that they're in England, and that he is going to act with nobility. There's going to be no slaughtering of the old guard. And he turns particularly on the Chief Justice, and inquires about a time when the Chief Justice arrested him. And the Chief Justice says that he had done so purely in the person of Harry's father. He had done so because he was upholding the law, and the law was under King Henry IV. And he also says, if you have a son, would you like me to let him abuse his position? And the prince answers, you are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. And I do wish your honors may increase, till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you, as I did. And so he clasps hands with the Justice, and he also asks the Justice to help guide him and offer him wisdom as he becomes king. Here, in some ways, Henry V is accepting a new kind of father figure, the father of justice, rather than the father of rebelliousness and wildness. It has to be a letting go of his past life. We cut back to Falstaff, who's having a party with Shallow, and Silence, who's very drunk, sings lots of drunken songs. Right in the middle of this, Pistol arrives with the news that Henry IV is dead and Henry V is on the throne. Of course, he does it in very Pistol-like fashion, with lots of obscure quotes and difficult-to-understand riddles. They all jump up and celebrate because now they think they're going to rise to the top and have anything they want. Falstaff says they can steal any horses they want to on the way back to London because the whole of London is theirs. Back in London, Hostess Quickly and Doll Tearsheet are being arrested because they were involved in the murder of a man that Pistol beat to death. And they use all kinds of tricks to try to get out of being arrested, including Doll claiming that she's pregnant. But the Beetle doesn't listen to them and hauls them off to jail. Hal's old friends are going to have to deal with justice. In the last scene, and perhaps the most famous moment in this play, Falstaff and the rest of the crew rush up to the coronation, where they see King Henry V riding through town. And as they rush up and try to get him to notice them and to embrace them and to raise them up into positions of power, Henry first calls the Chief Justice to stop Falstaff. And then when Falstaff calls out to him, he turns to Falstaff and says, I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man so surfeit swelled, so old, and so profane. But being awakened, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was, for God doth know. So shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear, I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and feeder of my riots. Till then I banish thee, on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten mile. For competence of life I will allow you that lack of means and force you not to evils. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will according to your strength and qualities, give you advancement." And so he tells Falstaff to no longer be in his presence. He must be ten miles away. There's a moment in the speech where he says, "...the grave doth gape 
for thee thrice wider than for other men. Which sounds like a joke, who is Falstaff is so fat, his grave's going to have to be extra wide. And for a moment it seems like, to Falstaff, that this is the old joking prince again, and he's about to jump in with another joke. But the king cuts him off and separates himself from Falstaff. And he calls the old man a dream of his past self. He is, in some ways, awakened now that he is king. He is a different person than he was. And there's so much pain to that, but he has to be a king. And there's so much pain to this, and there's so many ways that this speech could be said. How much grief does King Henry express as he's saying this speech? It is a letting go of a past and a letting go of old friends that is extremely painful. But the alternative is feeding the Kingdom of England to abuses and letting lawlessness reign, something that will deteriorate the state very quickly, as we saw back in Richard II. And as we've seen throughout the last two plays, Falstaff has difficulty accepting this, and he thinks that maybe Prince Hal is just making a show of this, and, but then in private he'll call Falstaff up and, and help him, and they'll be friends again. But the Chief Justice comes and drives them away. And it ends with Prince John, who had stood by his father throughout the rebellion, talking about the justice of this. King Henry is generous to his old friends in that he provides them with a living so they won't rob and go back to bad behavior. But he doesn't elevate them to positions of power where they will abuse the kingdom. And so it ends the end of this section, but there are more plays to come. In fact, an epilogue comes out at this time and apologizes for the play, which is the usual thing for an epilogue to do but also talks about the future play, the coming play about Henry V as a king. And in that play, there will be more Falstaff, only it turns out that there isn't. Shakespeare found no place for Falstaff in the next play. Of course, there are so many people that love Falstaff that he had to get another play anyway. And that play is called Merry Wives of Windsor. So in a way, this play has two more sequels. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.